just made, that, you know, wherever we are, we are always together. And there will be one day where we will be together uh, in a very special place. But, um, until that day, of course, you know, we can always look forward to meeting each other. And that's the special thing about making friends, isn't it? When you meet again, you continue where you left off. With much appreciation for the gift, and thank you very, very much. The, um, I've not measured the length of the garden that we bought. We didn't buy it because of the garden. It, we bought the place because of the bungalow. It's the semi-detached bungalow. But the garden was a bit bigger than what I anticipated. It's at least 100 foot long. Uh, and it's got nothing really in it. So the idea is to make the bottom third an orchard. And then, then there'd be the planting for the potatoes and everything else. And then there'd be the garden. You know, And it's got a pond in as well. Those of you who have seen my house. So I can continue with looking after fish from before. So... So, yes, that's appreciated. We will uh, plant fruit trees. And maybe, you know, if I come and pay a visit around about August time, I can bring some for you to taste as well. The second advent, the second coming of Jesus Christ. You know, just before the end of time, just prior to Jesus' appearance, he promised he would come again. He did warn us, we even read it in that passage in Matthew 24, that there would be a time of great difficulty in the world. It's a time that the Jews also call, they looked forward, they've, they've talked about that day too, as being a time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, it's a time when the people who are expecting and waiting for Jesus to come will be known as the elect. Maybe we're already in the time of Jacob's trouble. What's happening in the world around us at the moment? What has been taking place? Maybe. We don't know, but maybe. And if Jesus is about to appear, then where and who are the elect? Because for those, he said, the days in which we are in, if these are those days, will be shortened. Turn with me, if you've got your Bibles, to First Peter. That's letter of Peter. Towards the end of your Bibles, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. He introduces himself in this letter, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. To, he says, God's elect. All right, so there's that word again. To God's elect, strangers in the world, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, mainly in the area of Turkey there, who have been chosen, notice that word too, in regard to this word elect, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. The phrase elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. This letter that we're just looking at was written by Peter to a largely Gentile church. Chapter 2, verse 10 of that um, same letter makes this reference to that. Once you were not a people, but now you are. That's a, a, that's a phrase referring to, you know, they were one time not a people. In other words, they were Gentiles. And um, they now have become the people of God. That's what he's saying. Because the Gentiles when this letter was written by Peter, were considered by the Jews to be outside the mercy of God. It had actually been said by some Jews that God had actually created the Gentiles to be just fuel for the fires of hell. And that God loved only Israel of all the nations on the earth. Now, you won't find that in the Bible, but it had been said, you know, these things do go around, don't they? And it was being said at that time. Now, in this part of this letter, Peter calls these people, the Gentiles, the elect. You know, these who are only fuel for the fires of hell, he's actually saying they are the elect. And this title, God's elect, God's chosen people, was once a title that was applied only to Israel. If you look in passages like Psalm 105, verse 6 and verse 43... And Isaiah 45, verse 4, you'll come across that reference to Israel being God's chosen. And there are many more verses like that. But the nation of Israel failed and failed in the purposes of God because when the Son of God came, they actually rejected him. In fact, Jesus told the Jews a parable 
We, we're looking at parables today as well, aren't we? Right? And he told him a parable about a wicked husbandman. And he told that parable to illustrate this very fact, that the promises that had been given to Israel were going to be taken from them and given to other people. And that parable also is in Matthew, uh, if you want to just very briefly look at it, chapter 21. Chapter 21. And um, starting at verse 33, if your Bible has headings, it might say the parable of the tenants. And he says, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who, who planted this vineyard. And he goes on to say how, because he'd done it, he rented it out. He then came back to get what was due to him. And they treated them badly, you know, sending them away. And in the end, in verse 41, he made this conclusion. In verse 41... He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. He will take it from them and give it to others. That was the warning Jesus was given to the Jews. God had chosen them, but they'd rejected. He would take it from them and give it to others. So it is that God's elect then have come from every nation. They, are now, they, right, the other nations, not just Israel, are now the Israel of God. Um, we've seen that in Paul's letter in our recent studies. If you look at chapter 6 of Galatians and verse 16, Paul makes that same comment. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, even to the Israel of God even to the Israel of God, right? You know, he's making reference to them as well as, you know, as part of the, those who he's writing to in Galatia, who are Gentiles. And it says, as we've read already in First Peter, there is a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Some of us smile at this bit because Peter says, a peculiar people. I don't know who he's talking about, do you? Is it you? Right, A peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvellous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So he's talking there about the Gentiles. They were excluded. They didn't get mercy, but now they have. They're included. You know, a chosen generation a peculiar people, a royal generation as well. Now the purpose of looking at these verses is to understand the meaning of this word elect. And already we have one very clear insight into the word, and that is that the elect are from all nations. And though the elect include Jews, they are not all Jews. The Jews are the elect, sorry, the Jews that are elect, are elect because they've accepted Christ. But those that haven't are not. So it's therefore possible that some of us who are sitting here in this hall today are of the elect. So who are they? How are they elected, chosen, selected? How can we become one of the elect? To find answers, let's have a look at occasions where the word is used elsewhere. Let's look at Luke 23. This is, this is a very interesting one. Luke 23... And verse 35, Luke 23, verse 35. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, and this, this is, they're talking about Jesus Christ here at the time of his trial. They said, he saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ, the chosen one. So you've got those two phrases next to each other. The Christ, the chosen one. So, the chosen one. Does this mean that Jesus was chosen by God, for instance? Now, I, I thought, and, you know, when we think of the Godhead, the Trinity, 
that they arranged it between themselves and nobody did any choosing. And of course, having a choice, if you have a choice, then that means that you have a choice over at least two things, don't you? You can't have a choice of only one thing because you've only got one thing. That's, that's not a choice, is it? When you can choose, you're choosing between at least two options. So to have a cho choice means more than one thing, more than one option to choose from. But yet, when we think of the, the coming of Jesus Christ, there was no option. He was the only mediator, the Bible says. He's the only one, so there was no choice. So if we say Jesus was chosen, then are we actually inferring that he had no say in the matter either? Because he was chosen, so he didn't have any choice in the matter. One thing is very clear in this verse, and that is that the word Christ, which is alongside the word chosen, actually means anointed one, the anointed one. Almost the one that was selected, the one that was chosen, the one that was to be anointed is the one to be blessed in the sense. The anointed one. And because the word anointed one is next to the word the chosen one, you can also say the one that was elect. One translation of the Bible actually uses that word elect rather than the word chosen. So the anointed one is the same as the one who is elect. The anointed one is the same as the elect one. And the lesson I learned from that is that Jesus' life, his very words, obviously were a mark of the fact that this man wasn't just any man, he was the son of God. And if he's the chosen one, then he's elect, because he's a choice Christian. So could it be then that the elect are chosen, they are elect because their lives, their character, shows what God's like. Jesus was chosen, Jesus was elect because of what he was, how he showed what his life was. If you look at Matthew 24... Matthew 24 and verse 22. Again, Matthew 24 is the chapter, remember, where Jesus is talking about you know, what the end of time will be like and he's making warnings and, uh, about that and pre pre preparing people for those days. In verse 22, Matthew 24, 22, if those days had not been cut short, no one would survive, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. And then verse 24. For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive in the, even the elect, if that were possible. Notice that. To deceive even the elect, if that were possible. The elect here do have a special status. Because Jesus tells us that deceptions here are so good that in the last days many are going to be led astray by them, but if possible, even the elect. So it's not possible, isn't it? That's what he means. It's not possible. The elect in those days, it says, will have the day shortened. Yes, because of the deceptions. Because of the awfulness of those last days, God will shorten the time so that his chosen ones will not be deceived. Their character is such that they're not sucked into the delusions that will go on in these last days. So the character of the elect is also further emphasised by Paul in Colossians. Let me read to you what Paul says. In chapter 3 of his letter to the Colossians, he says this in verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen, there we have the word chosen again, elect, people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with, and then he lists virtues, such as compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with each other, forgiving each other. And over all of these things, it says in verse 14, put on love. You can also look up similar words in Romans 16 as well, verse 13. What's interesting about that one, if you look at this one, Romans 6, you've all got different translations here, I know, many of you, and it'd be just if we had time to hear what each one said. But let me just share a couple with you. 
In verse 13 of Romans 16, he's greeting individuals. And in verse 13, he greets Rufus, right? And he says, chosen in the Lord, in the New International Version. In the King James, it says, the elect in the Lord. And there's a translation, which some of you may have heard of, um, called Moffat's New, New Testament. And he says, a choice Christian, right? But there is a Phillips translation of the New Testament. It, I think it dates back to the 60s, the Phillips. And he says, and I love what he says, Rufus, that splendid Christian. That's what the word elect choice means. Children, do you know of a splendid Christian? Hmm? You know, if I was to ask you, you know, who would you say is a splendid Christian? Who would go through your mind? Heather. Heather. Oh, she's not listening. Okay, I'll just... <laughs> Yeah, she wasn't listening. She was, she was helping. Yeah. But that's what he's saying here about Rufus. There is somebody there he knows who in their Christian life is living out some of these wonderful examples of putting on love, you know, showing grace and humility towards other people, living out a good life, a helpful life to, and positive to so many people that he actually picks him out. Rufus, that splendid Christian. He was obviously an outstanding character in the way he followed Jesus. So in a, in a sense, you could say not only was he elect, maybe he was an elect elect. <laughs> you know what I mean? He was, he was special, wasn't he? And connected to this thought is also Paul's statement to Timothy. In the letter of Timothy, 2 Timothy, um, he says this in chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And verse 9 and 10. For we, he's, he's talking about remembering Jesus Christ uh, raised from the dead. And then he says, this is my gospel for which I, verse 9, am suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word isn't changed. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect. I endure everything for the sake of the elect. <laughs> The Apostle Paul, you know, if you think about it, he was in prison more than once. He could have renounced his faith. In the days in which Paul lived, you know, if he'd have burned incense, for instance, at the temple to Nero, he'd have been set free. Because when he burned that incense, he would, he would say as well, Nero is Lord. Because the Christians wouldn't. Because Jesus is Lord. But this was something that the Roman Empire brought out, a bit like what our government's trying to do with you know, making you good citizens, you know, with these things. You know, they tried to make people loyal citizens of the empire. So you would burn incense at the temples and you'd say, Caesar is Lord. You got a certificate. You're now a good citizen. Well, of course, Christians wouldn't do that because Caesar isn't Lord, Jesus is Lord. And that meant now they were not loyal citizens. I mean, could you ever think that that actually could come about? You know, the, that sort of thing is possible in what's taking place in our own times in this country, isn't it? But that's all he had to do was to just burn incense to Nero and he would be saved. But no, he wouldn't discourage others by his bad example. But by his good example, he's preaching the gospel, though he was in change, he was willing, even if he be through his own blood, to be the seed, in a sense, for others who would follow him. He wanted to be bold and preach the good news despite the opposition. And that's just what Peter was saying in our opening words. First Peter 1, 2, right? We read verse 1 when he says about to God's elect who are, who are scattered, you know, you have been chosen, verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and the sprinkling by his blood. Now, when we are chosen by God, we've got a challenge. We have a responsibility. Why? Because, you know, God doesn't just choose. He chooses for service. He chooses for you to do something. 
We cannot just sit back. We can't just sit there and consider ourselves, well, I'm elect, so I don't need to do anything. I'm a chosen one. You know, I can, I can sit in my armchair. I can feel secure in my election. You know, it's all in place, so I don't need to bother. He said, did Peter, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience. We are elect because of God's foreknowledge, he says. There's another question. What does that mean? What does that infer if we're elect according to God's foreknowledge? You know, some teach that God will arbitrarily select, choose, elect, from among people, Christians, to be saved. Just like that. Just pick them out. But could that be so? You know, if God foreknows, then it means he's able to look into the future. And so he knows what's going to happen. He'll know whether you and I make a foolish or a wise choice. He will know whether you and I choose Jesus as the saviour. He doesn't force us to make us Christians against our will. And, you know, if you think of foreknowledge as, well, and this is what some are saying, Calvinism is one of those areas where that he selects, well, that's forcing you against your will. It's putting you in a bracket you don't necessarily want to be in. It's because God knows our future that he predestines. God has never shown that he would choose only certain individuals. He's always said that he'll have everybody to be saved. And I'm quoting here uh, 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. He's not willing, Peter says, to have anybody perish, but that everybody finds eternal life. That's 2 Peter 3, 9. Ezekiel says, um, this is God speaking in Ezekiel's book of the Old Testament. As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their way and live. They make a choice to do what's wise. And then, of course, that passage we all love, John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave, that anybody who chooses. You could say it this way, whoever believes in him, God foreknew, shouldn't perish, but God predestined to have eternal life. You know, if God could, he'd save everybody, but he can't because of our free will. God gave us a free will and that gets in his way. And, you know, it would make him a liar, too, because he says that the soul that sins will die. It, we are the ones that make the right or the wrong choice. I believe God strives with every soul on earth, even though he knows their end. He still tries. So that he might prove to the universe, what more could I have done? And as it says in the Old Testament, he weeps over the lost house of Israel. Children, have you ever done something that, well, let, let me tell, John's here, my youngest. I remember when he was very little. Well, Brian, the oldest, is there as well. When um, we were at Newbold College, there was a family, I forget their names now, that were leaving to go to Canada. I remember that. And they got grown-up sons and so on. I think they were sort of late teens. And so, you know, obviously, if they were going to live in Canada, they had to empty the house. And um, Lego sets weren't cheap. And of course, we were students then either. And they gave him, Brian, a suitcase full of Lego. I mean, it was treasure. Right, never, never forget. But sometime later after this, we were at um, Stockport. John's only, I can't remember how old he was, three, maybe, four. And he was trying to, well, I had to shake his head. Two. Two, okay, no, he was quite young. And he's trying to put together some of this Lego. Right, and I can still see it today. Nothing was working right. He was trying. He, he put that and it fall apart. Do it again. It drop. And in the end, I'm not joking. I'm not. I'm not he picked the thing up. <laughs> <laughs> Even at that sort of age, <laughs> you know what I mean. Uh, you know, sometimes we've seen the same. You can be watching somebody who's doing something, doing a job, maybe homework, they're making a model, they're knitting or whatever it is, you know, and 
you've said to them, you, so, well, I mean, in this case, we didn't say anything, but I mean, you might actually say to them, well, if you do it this way, you'll find it easier. You know what I mean? Or you try to give them some guidance, but in the end, you've just got to sit back, haven't you? And you let them get into a mess. And I'm sure that's happened to all of us. You know, you then learn, of course, you, you know, I say with John, you know, when he smashed it, like he was upset, <laughs> right? Uh, and you let them get upset. We have to make the choices ourselves so often in life. And when we consider what God is doing for us as humans, in, in human beings, as trying to help us, we can appreciate how he feels when the Spirit of God is being spurned and rejected by us to our own detriment. And we finish up. You know, doing the same thing, smashing everything because we get so frustrated because we refuse to take the help that he provides. And Jesus told many a parable about the kingdom of heaven in order to explain what it was like and how we can enter it. In Matthew 22, he told that parable of the marriage feast that I spoke about earlier on. But there was another one there in the same chapter where he, there's a wedding feast there where he, he, people are invited and one person is in that wedding who's wearing their own garment. And he's thrown out because he's wearing his own garment. In those days, the kings, if they held a wedding, you know, and you were invited, Jean, they would give you their own wedding garment. You didn't have to buy one. They'd provide it for you, yeah. I mean, that would be lovely, wouldn't it? You know, they were, but he turned up in his own. In his own. But the point um, I'm trying to make here is that in that parable, Jesus concludes it with these words. It's in Matthew 22. And um, get to the right chapter. In verse 14, he says this, right at the end of it. For many are invited but few are chosen few are elect God sends out invitations he sent them to, you know for the Jews he sent Moses he sent Isaiah he sent Jeremiah he sent Ezekiel he sent Daniel he sent a host of other prophets and messengers and then came Jesus with the same invitation the same call to come unto me since Jesus, God has invited, he sent the apostles, he sent the disciples, he sent Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Wesley. He sent a host of people, and even you and me, to all over the globe. And many have been the invitations, but many varied excuses that people have made as well. The invitation has been offered freely. He says, does Jesus in Matthew 7, Whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. But he says, the ones who have done so are few. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Many of you in this room today are married, being married. And when you are courting, you know, when you think about it, you might date many girls, many men. But when you find the right one, you make a choice, don't you, to marry him or her. You ask her, you telephone her, or like some friends from ours from Halifax many years ago, the Whites, you remember them, Heather? They, he did it very romantically by inviting her to Italy, to Venice, and he actually paid for, and a very expensive, I understand, never been on one, a gondola, and he proposed to her on that gondola. You offer her an invitation to come and to join her life to yours. But you cannot force her to be your partner. And the other way around. She cannot force you to be her partner. You have to wait for an answer, for her consent. With me and Heather, we were just friends until the conference. She worked for the church as well then. was invited to, well, it wasn't such an invitation, but she got a call to go and work up in Glasgow. Well, Glasgow and Halifax are a long way apart. And I wasn't even driving a car in those days. I cycled everywhere. You know, that's too far to cycle. <laughs> and I suddenly realised I didn't want her to go. So, um, you know, realised there was more to our friendship than just that friendship that we had at that time. 
So my parents were away at that time. I was the, I'm, the, I'm the eldest of six. So the, the whole family had gone camping, and I was at, at home. And I invited her back for a meal with the intention of, you know, popping the question. I chickened out, didn't do it. Um, but I, was intent, I wasn't going get, to get away with it. I thought, well, right, okay. You know, she'd gone home, she had the car, she went home. And I thought, well, I'll phone her up. And of course, that's back in the days. I mean, we've been married 41 years now. You know, back in the days when very few people had phones. You know, we didn't have a phone in the house. So you had to use the phone boxes. That's when there were phone boxes, not defibrillator units, right? And um, as, a, you know, as a person who believed in God and wanted to do what God wants, because he knows better for our lives than I do, is this the right thing to do? So I said, you know, the, 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 it was like Gideon Slee. said to God, okay, I will phone from these phone boxes in my area. Well, sorry, I'm jumping ahead. I went to the first phone box, that's it, made the phone call and it was engaged. And it was engaged for a long time. I think I tried a couple of times engaged. And then I was making this prayer. Well, okay, I will use the phone boxes in my area. And if it's the same every time, I take it as a sign, this is not for me. This is wrong. This is, this is not the one. So I went to the next phone box. It was engaged. I went to the next phone box. It was engaged. I went to the next phone box. It was engaged. Right? I think there was five or six that were in my area. Can't remember his now exactly. It's 41 years ago. I remember, okay. And, I, and when I got to that, what I thought remembered or thought as it was the last one in my area, I thought I was disappointed. This God doesn't want this. And I'm walking away, and I suddenly remember there was one more I'd forgotten about, <laughs> right? So I went to that one. You know, they're all within walking distance of where I lived, and it, and she answered it. And of course, I asked the question. She didn't answer. Right. I had to ask her again. Well, we don't, you know. She was engaged. <laughs> she was engaged, thank you. Right. You know, sometimes with some people, it takes some weeks and years to answer, doesn't it? But she could even turn you down. And it's the same with God, but the other way around. You know, remember, he's the one that's asking. He's not the one waiting for the answer. He has chosen all of mankind, all sinners to be his sons and daughters. He wants us all to know and to love him, so he calls out through the word, you know, the Bible, through the preacher, through a card that comes through your door. He calls out through a friend. You know, Revelation twenty two seventeen says, Come. There's, it's, there's a very clear invitation for him. Come. But will we give him an answer? Come and be one of the elect. Come and be one of the chosen. One of the choice Christians. Who will be safe, safe from harm in that time of great trouble. One who will sit at the banquet in heaven with Christ to enjoy eternal life. Come, he says. Come. The question, of course, to all of us today is will we? Will we come? You know, when we think about it, can we actually stomach the, cho the, the, stomach the choices that we'll need to make to come? Could we give up some things in our lives so that we can be one of those elect and then live? You can be an elect. That's certain. You can be. But it's by choice. You don't necessarily have to be wicked, remember. That's what the children's story was. But a foolish person is one who makes the wrong choice. A wise person makes the right choice. And by that choice and action, you don't have to be a super Christian, but just a Christian that lives a Christian life. That's what it means to be an elect. A Christian who lives a Christian life. Won't we at least try it? Then you will be safe among the elect and able to enter into the kingdom of Christ and sit at his banqueting table. You've all got a little piece of orange paper. In your own privacy, you know, to yourself, I just want you to just put your initials on there. And if this is something you want to be, a Christian who lives a Christian life, you want to make that wise choice. Just put a tick on that piece of paper and put your initials and just fold it. 
And when you leave, put it in a basket. That's all I want you to do today. Just make that little choice, a little tick. I want to be a Christian that lives a Christian life. I want to be a delight. I want to make a wise choice. That's all it is. A tick and your initial. And just fold it. And afterwards, you know, when the church is at prayer, maybe you'll be able to take those and just pray over them. God will help you to live out that elect life. Shall we pray? Our Father, help us, we pray, to make wise choices in our lives. And Lord, give us the strength to do what's right and to live with you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.